Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, today, I'm going to be getting my geek on with Avi Friedman, CEO of a company called Kentic, which is a network observability company. And he has decades of experience as a technologist, networking executive, not to mention a professional poker player. And he has enjoyed an incredible career And he's also armed with the kind of stories that you could just listen to for hours, honestly. But I don't want to reveal too many spoilers. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Seattle so we can speak with him right now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Well, hi, everybody. I'm Avi Friedman. I am a nerd since the 1980s that fell into networking, and I uh, run a company called Kentic that makes the internet go. Excellent. And you have decades of experience as a technologist, networking executive, and a professional poker player. So I've got to ask, first of all, how did these worlds collide? And can you remember where your passion for tech came from and what put you on this path you're on today? Or in geeky terms, what's your origin story? Sure. So uh, we'll put the poker aside, maybe. Um, When I was eight, my uncle gave me a book on basic programming, which was a computer language, uh, sort of the Python of the day. And my father, who was a pulmonologist, was doing medical research into fascinatingly lung obstructions, but using old eight-bit computers. And he said, oh, I think I have, uh, you know, we have computers that run basic down at the hospital. And so uh, I started with a very hackerish pattern of coming down late at night and hacking overnight on the weekends. And uh, that's how I got into computers. I discovered that I enjoyed being able to think of creating something and beating my head against it until it either worked or didn't. Um, That's still sort of how I operate. I'm, I'm less of a software engineer and more of an exigent engineer. And the code that I write is uh, more, uh, running proof of concept, running specification. Uh, But I love that first, like, let's get it created um, and see whether it works or not. And so that whole cycle is something I have a passion for. Love that. And I'm curious, does that coding mindset help as a poker player too? Uh, Yes. I think that the logical mindset and do these things fit together and does this work is probably 80 or 90% of uh of the key to success in poker there's definitely a little bit of oh his pimple twitched so he's maybe bluffing but for the most part if you read the books and and get into poker a lot of it is does the story that i'm hearing make sense so it's coding uh because it's logic uh it's also really getting to know people and listening to uh, having a great bs detector so a little bit of business background helps as well and here in 2021, Kentic is a network observ- observability company. So can you tell me more about the kind of problems that you set out to solve and also what makes Kentic a little bit different from all the other companies in this space? Absolutely. So I was actually, uh, I had started the first ISP in Philadelphia, struggled with network monitoring and management um, in, back in the 90s, back when it was, it was uh, there was little data and little analytic technique. I actually joined uh uh, what became a leading ind- internet company called Akamai in 1999 and finally could solve some of those problems because they had massive computer and, and scalable infrastructure. Um, and when I left Akamai in uh, 2009, I began to see that most of the world still hadn't solved running, I'll call it modern infrastructure, sometimes virtual, sometimes physical, so often orchestrated the internet, SaaS, your own networks, um, you know, the mix of modernizing infrastructure. And so I decided to, uh, first I was doing something that was more, how do I get the data? And then all the people that bought that technology said, well, how do we analyze and use the data and make our businesses fast and secure? Um, and so that was uh, what led to starting Kentic. And interestingly, I've, I had always been in recurring revenue businesses from ISP to CDN, 
And uh, when I started, everyone said, no, this is, we know this is a big data problem. We'd rather just run this as a service. And I said, well, how convenient, because I'd rather sell it as a service. <laughs> and then we can, you know, be constantly releasing software and always making it better. And, you know, the SaaS uh, mantra, which I have a, a big belief in. And just to bring to life what we're talking about here, especially for leaders of digital businesses, corporate IT teams, or service providers listening, do you have any examples that you could share of just how you're helping them? Sure. So you named three somewhat different groups, each with different um, yeah. core use cases. So people that are leading the digital business, I'll call it the line of business in a traditional enterprise or maybe the CTO org in a, in a digital native company, they're sending all the telemetry from what they call their production infrastructure that makes the revenue for the business. So in this case, the network really is the business and all the revenue of the business flowing over it. And that could be the traffic data, often called flow. It could be from routers and switches or cloud. It's synthetic transactions to validate performance. And it's really integrating all the metadata about what are the applications and who are the customers and the users. And then we're basically trying to take all that and tell them in advance, here are your performance and security problems, and here's what you should do about it. So it's really making the revenue of the company flow, reducing brand risk, increasing revenue, um, and then productivity and agility. So really being able to get instant answers on a modern platform saves people time. And a lot of those businesses have been in constant hire mode for, you know, for at least five years. And so they really don't have the time to be futzing with time series databases and elastic and trying to build everything on their own. They really just need something that works. On the corporate IT side, it's really about connecting the employees and their applications, which with COVID, the world has really leaped to a place where sneaker net, if you are old enough to remember what that is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is no longer an option, right? Oh, my novel is down. Let me, let me just go <laughs> take a floppy over to my neighbor. And so um, that is the SaaS applications, it's the endpoint connectivity, what's the performance, the internet supporting this. And often the applications they're running are not ones that they've developed, but the ones that they have to support. And again, so that can be private cloud, it can be data center. And so because we can help them hybrid. And so um, performance in this case is more about productivity and keeping the employees and, and the teams working, and then also um, security. Um, and then last is the service providers, which is a large part of our business. And again, like the first uh, set of customers, the network is their business. Now, they're all trying to figure out how to get out of what I call CapEx jail, which is only making a fixed return based on buying things. So they want to make services and we have white label portals and can help them. But fundamentally, their help desks, their architects, their product people, they want to, they need to keep, they, they have to keep the infrastructure going, and then they want to make great services um, on top of it. And again, a lot of their customers, the number one thing they care about is Office 365 and Google Apps working, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this SD-WAN or SASE or whatever we call it <laughs> underneath. But if people like that middle camp, if they can't get to the applications, then they're going to be, you know, more unhappy than if two packets got lost in an extra you know, 100 microseconds happened between, uh, you know, Birmingham and Cambridge. So, And I'm curious, so much has changed over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And you must have a lot, your phone for your team must be ringing off the hook with all kinds of questions and concerns and challenges. Are there any trends in the kind of questions that your customers are asking for your help with at the moment? And are you helping them turn those challenges into opportunities? Yeah, so... The biggest set of things that's been changing is cloud. And the second biggest thing is related, which is infrastructure as code and orchestration. Now, cloud is just other people's infrastructure as code with strange names and their own software bugs. And then you're victimized by it when you're using their infrastructure and you need to see into it somehow and make it work with your infrastructure. So cloud, cloud migration, app modernization, again, across our, our major customer segments is what is driving a lot, of, a lot of need and interest. And then the second part, which is really being able to understand that where, you know, your machines are not named Fred and Wilma, but are ephemeral containers with, you know, with UUIDs and, and things that you're just not going to provision manually. And so 
uh, Kintik started from that world. We came, you know, from the web scale, cloud scale world, and we make it very easy in a what's called product led growth to try it out and see it and learn. We don't hide the secrets. We've never been a stealth company. So uh, when people are calling, it, it's often about that. Um, and then, of course, uh, I have to make all this work, but it's not mine anymore, which again is broadly speaking, you can call cloud, right? Whether it's internet or SaaS, anything that isn't yours is other people's stuff is cloud or cloud is other people's stuff. So just had a flashback there when you were saying that machines are not called Fred and Wilma. I was once working through a business back in the day and I was in the data center and a systems engineer had set a machine up and it had the name Rita. And I said, Oh, Rita, does that stand for, for something? And he said, no, it's my mum's name. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that used to be a thing, right? You would start yeah. a company and the first debate would be what should we call the machines? Is it Star Wars? Is it Lord yeah. of the Rings? Is it what's the origin story of your machines? But conversely, the the ca- servers are cattle and not pets is that idea that it used to be, well, don't bother Fred with databases because uh, he doesn't like them or Wilma does best, uh, <laughs> you know, in in a different data center, you know, and we don't want to, you know, you don't think like that right now. It's sort of cold, ruthless heartless, but if your compute doesn't work, you just sort of assassinate it and, and restart it from its its specification um, and give it to some poor other sap who comes into that Amazon instance and has problems and, and, and doesn't have great observability and is left to scratch their head. Oh, man, so many memories bring, coming back from that. And, well, do you read I've, The Reg? I'm sorry to quote other press, but yeah, no, their, their headlines are the best. Their headlines are the best. <laughs> So I'm curious, we've both seen so many changes, but what are the biggest lessons that you've learned throughout your career, would you say? Uh, well, uh, biggest lesson is it's about people. And if you help mm-hmm. people, then you're making an investment that will just pay back um, many times over later on. So I didn't start doing it with evil, selfish motives, but I enjoy helping people get unconfused. And I've discovered that, if you're willing to have, maybe it isn't the best way of saying this, but no shame, like, hey, I was just confused. And I'd like to tell you that BGP has these strange rules because they didn't design it right. But here are the strange, here's the, here are the flaws. And that's why these four confusing things have happened in the border gateway protocol. Julia Evans is awesome at this. She draws zines, which are really, a lot of people would be like, oh, but of course that's known you know, like, like Game of Thrones, it is known. It's like, well, (laughs) until you know it, it isn't known. And often the stuff is self-referential mumbity-gook. And uh, so like the the biggest thing I've learned is uh, help people, educate people, and then, you know, good stuff, good stuff happens. And then technology, obviously just don't get, don't get stuck. And, you know, I, I gritch and grumble. I, I hate Go and Python because I, I, I'm a very, I'm a purist from the 90s. And I think languages should not care about space or uppercase letters or <laughs> stuff like that. But people love it and it helps them go and, you know, whatever. So that's awesome. So, you know, it, the world doesn't stay static. And if you want it to stay static, then uh, um, you should, you know, treat that as a hobby, but in the professional world, you have to not fight change. That's the Absolutely. another thing. So. Especially in the world of tech. And yeah. I, I never thought I would uh, ask this question. I think it's, I've never asked it before in over 1,600 interviews, but I did come into <laughs> this world with a curious mind. So I've got to ask, have your poker skills helped you in your, in your tech career at all? Uh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, yeah. so the way that we started playing poker was actually at Akamai. Yeah. Our um, really amazing co-founder, Danny Lewin, was the actually the first person murdered by the terrorists on 9-11, even before the first plane hit the World Trade Center. And as a network group, we came together and people said, let's, let's start socializing and, and doing things outside and playing games. So I've seen rounders way too many times. <laughs> and at the time, it was, you know, just like, let's just have fun and follow the black queen and stuff like that. Um, but then both my brother and I got into it, um, you know, more regularly. And there's a bunch of, of interrelated lessons and I think they really help each other. Um, one of them is the difference between um, expected value and variance, which is 
really don't overemphasize the short term result if you have confidence that what you're doing is 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 the correct thing to do. So you see that a lot in sales, more than maybe programming. But if you think that something is right, don't don't wait for just one or two um, results because anything can happen in the short term. But if you help people make great things and 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 learn it, maybe in the mid to long term basis, that's the best way to think. And it really helps people in a business because if you change strategy all the time, then it can be confusing and you need to have a little bit of consistency. And, and then what I said, I mean, just having a good BS detector, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's also, I'm not a parent, but you know, where I won in today's world, there's all this information, like amazingly more information than people like me who grew up having to go to a library to actually look things up, um, you know, had, but it, it's always tinged by, you just have to have a little bit of look for emotion words. Does this make sense? Is what is someone's agenda? And again, it's, it's uh, business helps poker and, and poker helps business. And then there is one big difference though. In business, you want to be working with the best. In poker, you really don't want to be playing with the best. So, you know, while it's fun to say I beat Phil Ivey, you know, in a hand or whatever, uh, if he's better than you, um, you know, or or Jennifer is better at playing poker or whatever, then probably you want to be at a different table. So there are some differences too. And I think also at the moment, you just mentioned there about the BS detector. And I fear for so many businesses at the moment that they're obviously bombarded with emails, phone calls, and visits to the reception of artificial intelligence and blockchain companies that don't actually have blockchain or artificial intelligence. And there's so much of that going on. But what is it that excites you about the emerging technologies that we're starting to see now and the future role that Kentic will play in that future too? So what's really exciting to me is this concept of orchestration. Um, we have a big announcement um, that as we record this is coming out today with New Relic. It's integrating across the stack, network, network platforms and infrastructure, understanding the applications, applications, understanding the infrastructure, even coming together with security. And so look, it's true that a lot of blockchain could be done just as arguably more securely with SQLite on a VM on Amazon and an API, yeah. right? Not everything needs to be decentralized distributed, but there are some interesting things there, which really think of it as digital notary and ways of people cooperating and building ecosystems. And it's like, oh, okay, that helps us innovate and evolve how our businesses operate, how the technology operates. You know, at least the statistical side of machine learning helps humans operate better. You know, yeah, there isn't always AI, but, and as a technologist, it could be hard to cut through uh, the architecture and, and the obfuscation, but the fact that we can turn on every kind of infrastructure and application on demand is a huge uh, benefit and also challenge to running things. Um, and I think there's that that innovation style and the world getting complex is going to help people, and then also create a lot of opportunity as we try to run all this, you know, in the digital age. One of our customers says. Um, in, in plain speak, he says, without the network, there is no cloud. In Zen speak, he says, network is the water of the clouds, which is very yeah. deep, but. Whoa. Um, whoa. <laughs> but, you know, but people are not configuring those things manually. So again, that's a trend we're going to keep seeing, you know, right now in the network world, a lot of companies are pushing towards automation, which is using Python to write something instead of that one CLI thing that you used to do. But again, it's just at the beginning. How do you do that? How do you do that with software engineering? How do you not replicate the effort? I think it's pretty exciting. It really is. And we started our conversation today with talking about your origin story. But now as we come to the end of the podcast, I want to explore the soundtrack of your life and ask, is, <laughs> is there a particular song that has inspired you throughout your career or helped you get in the zone before you go to a big meeting or hit that poker table? Is there a particular song that springs to mind for you? Uh, well, skipping the silly and inappropriate Monty Python songs, <laughs> um, I would say, or the theme song of, of Blake seven, which was, uh, I was a favorite of a fan of, um, I'd say final countdown, but um, 
sometimes variants on the song can be even better. Like Weird Al variants can be can be sometimes better than the original. So there's two variants. One is a nightcore variant, which is where they speed it up and and add a little bit of electronic uh, uh, riff to it. And the other is a band called Van Canto, which is acapella heavy metal. Uh, their take on it. So that would have to be my their version of the final countdown. Man, I used to love Joey Tempest back in the day. I need to, check, <laughs> I need to check this out. I've not heard of this before. Oh yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, well, they do. They do Master of Puppets from Metallica. They do some, you know, they do Rebellion, um, you know, which you can find with either Scottish or or, or Game of Thrones um, or Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, uh, uh, animation playing in the background. So I, I recommend them. Have you heard of pirate metal as well? A friend yeah. introduced me to that. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, there's electronic pirate metal too, with the Jack Sparrow theme song, um, which again, it's a little sped up, and yeah, sometimes the subtitles so you can actually understand what they're saying. So, oh man, I love that. Well, you've given me something to do at the end of this podcast. But be- awesome. Before, before I let you go, can you remind everyone listening of where they can find you online and also contact your team if they've got any questions? Sure. So Avi Friedman, um, uh, A-V-I-F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N. So that's on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, Avi Friedman. Um, my email address is uh, avi at kentik.com, K-E-N-T-I-K.com. That's our website. And if people are in the industry and adjacent industries looking for pointers, I'm, I'm happy to hear from you. We've covered so much ground in a short amount of time today. I think we've covered everything from the lessons learned throughout your career and poker skills that have helped you in the tech industry. I'd love to stay in touch with you, get you back on later on in the year after I've listened to uh, some acapella metal, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I I appreciate it. Look forward to being on again. A huge thank you to today's guest for discussing the lessons learned throughout his career, including how his poker skills have helped him in the tech industry, not to mention introducing me to the world of a cappella metal. Man, this episode had it all, didn't it? But if you've got any questions or want to share your insights, opinions, or even your personal story and get you on here to share it with everyone. I'd love to do that too. Whatever it is, simply message me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Just look for me at Neil C. Hughes. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk, where you'll find over 1,600 interviews. And everyone is all killer and no filler. (laughs) But I'll return again tomorrow with another guest. Hopefully you'll join me again too. But before I go, just a genuine thank you from me for taking the time to add me to your podcast feed and let me waffle into your ears every day. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.